Thank you for the introduction. So the next topic is how we use V8, the JavaScript engine V8 inside NativeScript, and more specifically inside the NativeScript Android runtime. My name is Stani Mirova. I'm part of the NativeScript team. Uh, I'm also part of Progress. And since recently, I'm a Google developer expert for, expert for Angular. You can find me anywhere with my full name. Because my nickname was taken on Twitter, I really regret that. But anyway, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I always love uh, discussing different things like Angular, NativeScript, Webpack, and other different technologies that I uh, work with. So please reach out to me if you need uh, emotional help while configuring your Webpack config. <laughs> so with that important thing, uh, our story today will have three parts. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to ignore the fact that we have seven macarons here. Anyway, so three parts, only three parts. First of all, uh, if you're not sure how you got here today, uh, if, or if you missed uh, all the previous lectures, what is native script? Well, what is native script? <laughs> no one is sure, right? <laughs> Me neither. So the shortest definition that I told of is it's a way to run JavaScript in the mobile world. And kind of a longer version is it's a way to build mobile apps, native mobile apps, for Android and iOS using some technologies that we usually use in the web development world, like JavaScript, CSS, Angular, Vue, and so on. So let's take apart the NativeScript architecture. On the bottom, we have Android and iOS, obviously. Then we have a second layer, which is the NativeScript runtimes. We have two runtimes, two separate pieces for Android and iOS, and their purpose is to provide us with a way to execute JavaScript on Android and iOS and access the underlying uh, native APIs. So not just the hardware of the phones, but also things like UI widgets and uh, layouts and stuff like that. But <clears throat> as you may have noticed, Android and iOS are kind of kind of different, right? So we need a layer that unifies the APIs. And that layer in NativeScript is usually written in JavaScript or TypeScript because we have access to the Java and the Objective-C Swift world through JavaScript. The cross-platform layer is in JavaScript. So the cross-platform layer unifies the way we build apps, unifies the way we do layouts, we do user interface, we style our applications, and so on and so on. And then on top of that, we provide something uh, out of the box that I like to call NativeScript Lite or um, NativeScript Core. And it's a very minimal application framework. Uh, it provides you with data binding, navigation, and other cool things that you can use to build your apps. And of course, if you need something more sophisticated or you want to do code sharing between web and mobile, you can also use Angular or Vue.js. So with all that said, that short overview, today we are going to focus on uh, the runtimes, the bottommost part. And more specifically, I will talk about the Android runtime. And you may be wondering why, well, I don't have a MacBook, so <laughs> I have no way to run the iOS runtime. Anyway, so we're going to talk about Android. OK. The most important part of native script, as you may have noticed, native script, the thing that we brag most about is the native API access. And this is the thing that kind of differentiates native script from the other cross-platform solutions. We have 100% access to the underlying uh, native APIs. So I will try to explain how we achieve that in the Android world. First of all, let's take a look at the application package of a native script application. This is a phone, <coughs> kind of. I mean, you can see how well I can draw with uh, Google Slides shapes. So this is an Android phone, obviously. Uh, and we have an Android application. And this is also a native script application. And how do we know it's a native script application? Well, it has some native script magic inside. And what is the magic? So the first part of the magic is the JavaScript code that a native script developer writes in order to 
build their mobile application. And the JavaScript code is shipped together with the Android application. When you build it, the JavaScript code is shipped together with the whole APK. It doesn't get compiled or whatever, it stays JavaScript all the time. After that, we have a library that's, that's hidden from the NativeScript developer. Uh, I'm, I'm going to call that the NativeScript runtime. And the NativeScript runtime is kind of the control center for everything that, um, that runs in the NativeScript application. Okay, the first thing that we need to have, we need to figure out how to do is executing JavaScript. So to execute JavaScript, we use V8. And V8 is a JavaScript engine, hence it can execute JavaScript. <coughs> V8 is developed by Google actively. I think it's 11 years old. And also it's used inside Chrome, Node.js, and of course the NativeScript Android runtime. It was specifically built for Chrome and it was released together with Chrome and it's very, very well integrated. And it's also said that it's a modern JavaScript engine because it uses a lot of optimizations like just-in-time compilation and other magical tricks to make our JavaScript code really performant and fast. There are great resources on the web on how the modern JavaScript engines work. I'm not gonna talk about this today, but if you open the V8 documentation, uh, it's explained in a fabulous way. And I really yeah, recommend you to check it out because it's, it's interesting for a JavaScript developer to understand what happens under the hood. Okay, obviously we have V8 and the NativeScript runtime boots up V8 and V8 can execute the JavaScript code. And if you try to execute this line, this line is very, very valid NativeScript code if you run it for Android. What will happen? Well, we will get an instance of some media recorder. But why does that work? I mean, if you try to execute that in a, I don't know, node context or in the browser, we will get an error. Because Android is not a reserve world or it's not some global thing, it's, I mean, it's not there by default. It's not in the JavaScript language, right? So what kind of trick does the NativeScript runtime do to enable us to use Android? Android dot media something. We have a couple of steps here that I'm gonna go through. The first thing is called the metadata generator. Okay, let's imagine that we have some native library. For example, the Android SDK. And the Android SDK uh, contains the media package and, of course, the Android package. It contains some information about all these APIs and how we can use them inside a native script application. So you have that native SDK installed on your machine. While you're building your native script application, native script runs the metadata generator, which traverses that native, uh, na native library and figure us out what is the API and how the API can be used. For example, what does the constructor of the media recorder um, accept? What are the arguments for the constructor? Or uh, what methods are available when you create an instance of that uh, recorder? So we get all that information and then NativeScript saves that in a binary format somewhere. And as you can guess, yeah, we get the metadata for all that. So we know how, how Android um, creates it, or how we can use Java to create it. We don't know yet how to use JavaScript to create it, but we know how uh, if you were writing a Java Android application, you can create a media recorder. And of course the metadata gets inside the application as well. So this is kind of, kind of everything that we have in a native script application. Okay, we have the information how to use these APIs, but how do we use this information when using the APIs? Let's see what happens when you boot up a native script application. Well, first of all, V8 is initialized. Then the metadata is loaded. Then we attach some callbacks that we're gonna talk about in a second. And then we load the, the JavaScript. And the JavaScript is then executed by V8 inside the virtual machine. Okay, the callbacks, a really important part. It's where we hook up or um, 
the methods we use to hook up into V8. Okay, we have this line of code again. What is Android? Android is a global object because when we, okay, when I say we, I mean uh, <laughs> the Nescript runtime. I mean, it's kind of weird because I associate myself with Nescript. Anyway, <laughs> so when we read the metadata on launch, we see that uh, there is a global package called Android. Then Android is going to be a global variable in the JavaScript world. And then we set that global variable in the running V8 instance. Okay, when we query android.media, we have attached a callback to Android. So the callback is called, uh, is invoked, and the callback kind of tries to find uh, media inside the Android package. And we get an object. We get an object about what android.media contains. The same thing for android.media.media recorder. Again, a package getter callback is called and we find the media recorder class inside Android Media. And because Android Media is a class, we get back a constructor function. <coughs> All right, what happens when we try to instantiate this object? We have the constructor function, right? And when we invoke the constructor function with new, um, it's called and we, inside the constructor function, there is a constructor callback and the job of the constructor callback is to actually create the Java object, the actual Java object in the Android world, through V8, through the running JavaScript engine. But the question is, how exactly does that happen? I mean, it's not that uh, trivial, right, <laughs> to create a Java object through JavaScript. Uh, the Namescript runtime uses JNI, or Java Native Interface, and uh, the job of this layer is to send instructions back and forth from the two running virtual machines. That's it. And hence we can instantiate a native Java object through V8, through the running V8 instance. So we get the Java object inside V8 and we create a JavaScript proxy for that Java object. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that we can't just assign a reference uh, to a Java object through a JavaScript variable, right? We need a JavaScript object. So that's why we create a proxy. And the proxy basically contains the same methods, the same, the same interface that the Java object uh, has. And we ret return the proxy object back to the JavaScript world. Okay, here we have the proxy object. Again, it's very important in the why we are building our native script app, we don't care that this is a proxy object. We don't even know. Uh, we just have a recorder and we think that this is the created recorder in the Java world, right? But it is actually a proxy. So when we try to get some random field from that object, we trigger another callback. And this is the field getter callback. And Obviously, the job of the field getter callback is to call the original Java object and get the field back. But there is a little complication here. If we get the field from the Java object, we're going to get, for example, some string, right? But can we assign the string to the JavaScript object? Yes, no, someone? No. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> No, no, we can't, we can't, because we got a Java string. And this is a different data format. We can't just assign it to a JavaScript variable. So we have another tiny layer here that's called the marshalling service. And the idea is that we can convert uh, primitive objects and arrays from Java to JavaScript and vice versa. And again, uh, if you ask, wouldn't that be terribly slow if we do it for objects? Well, probably it will be. And uh, that's another reason why we use proxies for objects. Okay, what happens if we invoke some, uh, some function or some method? Well, a method callback, obviously. So the method callback calls the original Java object. If we provided some arguments, they're marshalized again from JavaScript to Java. We get the result from the Java method and we return it to the JavaScript world. 
after marshalizing it, of course. Okay, is everything clear? Yes, now is the time to say yes, otherwise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's not clear, doesn't it? It's okay, it's okay. I mean, yeah. Cool, now we're gonna talk about startup time. <laughs> Why startup time? Well, <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't make sense in this presentation, but it's my favorite topic, so I decided to include it. And yeah, I wanted to talk about Webpack. All right, let's talk about time uh, after seeing this trippy slide. And more specifically, what takes time when we try to boot up our application? Well, quite a lot of things, right? We saw a few of them, like uh, firing V8, loading metadata, stuff like that. Actually, all these things are quite fast. But what really takes time in a native script application compared to a native application is JavaScript. And more specifically, loading the JavaScript. So when we start the application, the first thing that we should do with the JavaScript is to load it from the file system. And now you may be wondering, like, why does that take time? I mean, it is not a web application, we don't really do any uh, requests to remove URLs or whatever to fetch stuff. Instead, we do file system requests. So yeah, of course, your Wi-Fi connection doesn't matter. But the file system requests also take time. And if you have many of them, they can take quite a lot of time. Like, how much was it? Rowdy, 12 seconds for loading an app. Yeah. OK, so imagine that you have some node modules. <laughs> Like, uh, you have to, like, most people don't have node modules, obviously, but sometimes you have to have node modules. And imagine that you try to make a million file system requests when you boot up your application. Well, it will take quite some time. So what is the uh, easiest solution? To model your project into a few output files. The idea is that you're not gonna make a million requests on startup, instead you're gonna make three or five or even 10 or whatever. Uh, I mean, less than 100 is much better than 1 million. And fewer file system requests means that uh, you're gonna achieve faster launch times. What else? Well, in Ascript, the way to do that is uh, with Webpack. Maybe there are other ways, but <laughs> okay, I love Webpack. That's why I recommend it. <laughs> no, one, no one believes me, right? Yeah. And most importantly, uh, you know that I love Webpack, but the most important thing is that the Namescape team also loves Webpack. And as you um, heard in the morning, uh, Webpack is gonna be the default way to build Namescape tabs starting in the next minor version. And what is, what is more important, uh, the other way to build Namescape tabs, I mean, without Webpack, uh, it's going to be eventually deprecated in the future, so you might want to uh, start thinking about uh, switching to Webpack. And why do we do that? Because we prioritize performance and we also prioritize uh, development experience. And that's why we also prioritize hot module replacement with Webpack. So yeah, what else takes time with the JavaScript? We loaded it from the file system. Eventually now, uh, V8 has to parse it and compile it. And here's, there's a very, very great blog post by Arius Mani on um, JavaScript startup performance. It's not related to NativeScript in any way. It's actually uh, kind of related to the web, but it really applies to all kinds of JavaScript. Node.js, NativeScript, um, the web. It's a great blog post, really, really recommended. So, back on parsing and compiling JavaScript. As I said, V8 is very, very modern uh, JavaScript engine. It doesn't just interpret JavaScript. It parses it, it compiles it, it makes some um, optimizations, and all that is really great when our app is running and uh, we're doing stuff inside it, and uh, the JavaScript is really fast, but there is some overhead that happens on startup because of all these optimizations. So yeah, one common misconception is that JavaScript is just interpreted line by line. Well, that's not really what happens, or at least it's not the only things that happens on startup. So parsing and compiling can take quite a lot of time. But 
We can't just skip it, right? Eventually, we have to parse and compile a JavaScript because we need to run the application. But yeah, we have to load it at some point. And by default, it's loaded at runtime. And what if I told you that we can do that at build time so that we can skip that whole part of parsing and compiling when we start the app? Well, mm -hmm. I guess you'll be impressed or not. You don't uh, look very impressed. Yeah, one guy's impressed. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Okay, so there is a way to do that with V8. And the feature is called custom startup snapshots or custom heap snapshots. And very important note, um, it's only available um, for Android because we are using V8 for Android and we are using uh, another JavaScript engine for iOS. That's the reason why we have snapshots only for Android. So how does it work? You can use it today <laughs> in your application if you're using Webpack. So when you build the application, you have your project files. Webpack bundles them into a few output files. Then the snapshot plugin takes one of the files. It takes the vendor file, which usually contains uh, the node modules of your app or your external uh, dependencies. And it runs it to a snapshot generator. What does the snapshot generator do? Well, it fires up a V8 instance. It uh, parses and compiles and loads the vendor.js file. And then when the whole JavaScript is loaded, it takes a snapshot of the heap at the current moment and saves that on the file system into a few uh, blob files. Uh, we have here three blob files because they are architecture specific, like depending on uh, what device your application is running on. Then these blob files, which contain the snapshot, are packaged together in your application. Okay, we have the snapshots inside your application package and when we boot up the application, what happens is we load the snapshot, we initialize V8 by providing it um, the context containing that snapshot, so we have everything fired up and ready and we can skip the part when we um, load vendor.js and parse it and compile it. Then we load the metadata and we attach some callbacks. And then we proceed with uh, loading some other JavaScript, for example, our application code. And what is the problem with uh, the snapshots? Well, as I said, um, the whole thing is done at build time. So we don't have the metadata, we don't have callbacks, and we don't have the native APIs. <coughs> Obviously, we don't have access to Android. And here's an example. Here we're trying in this few lines of code to get the version of the current, whatever, uh, the current Android version of the phone or the device that we're running on. And obviously if we try to execute that at build time on our uh, developer machine, this will throw an error. Because, okay, one obvious reason is that we don't know what version uh, or what devices we're gonna execute this code on. And the other uh, thing is that the context that the snapshot tool creates is a bare context. We don't have access to the native APIs. So Android is not a keyword. It's not available. So the easiest solution to this problem is to wrap that and don't, uh, don't interpret it at build time. So we can wrap that in a function that's called get version, and we can use it inside the other function. That way, um, the native API access, whatever, won't be executed and uh, the snapshot generation will work. And this is again the reason, uh, one of the reasons why we try to, um, to execute a snapshot only from vendor.js and not from your application code because your application code naturally will, um, the first file there will try to uh, import TNS core modules which will contain a lot of API access, right? Okay, so this is the way to fix your snapshot errors if you happen to have some. <laughs> and Webpack is becoming the default one, so you have to face <coughs> some issues, sorry. 
Maybe. Okay. What is the uh, outcome? Be lazy by wrapping this API access, like do it in the lazy way. And I also like this GIF. Thanks to Alex. Uh, yeah, he showed me the GIF. Okay. Thank you. Um, I will share the slides on Twitter or you can find them later, I guess, on the website. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much.